All right, everyone, we are going to go ahead and get started with our webinar this morning. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone, uh, and thank you very much for joining today. On behalf of the AgriLinks team, I would like to welcome you to the June AgriLinks webinar on soil variation and why it matters in the agricultural development space. Our speakers today are from the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Assets and Market Access, which is also known as the AMA Innovation Lab. Uh, this innovation lab is managed by the Bureau for Food Security's Markets and Partnership Innovation Office uh, in order to support research on inclusive market access and risk management. And the results of, of this Feed the Future Innovation Lab and other innovation labs, um, the, the results support the goal and objectives of the Global Food Security Strategy, uh, which as you all know is a, a very important guiding principle for the government's um, agricultural development programming moving forward. And uh, as such, um, we are very excited to be able to uh, disseminate research findings from the AMA Innovation Lab through today's webinar. Before we get started with the content, I'd like to provide just a couple of reminders. First, the chat box is your main way to communicate today, and I see that many of you have already taken advantage of the chat box on the bottom right of your screen. Uh, thanks to everyone who's introduced yourselves. It's always really fun to see that we've got a global audience for these webinars. And throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat box to network, to share links and resources, and to ask any questions about the presentations. We will hold most of those questions until after the, uh, the presenters have presented today, and then ask them during a Q&A portion of the webinar. And next, you'll see on the left of your screen a variety of recommended resources in the resources box and the links box at the bottom left. Uh, so we encourage you to download throughout the webinar today. And uh, we are also recording this webinar and we'll post the recording, a transcript, and other resources to AgriLinks within two weeks. If you are watching the webinar right now, that means you're already on the email list to receive a link to the recording. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, and I believe I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And I'll be uh, facilitating the webinar today, kind of keeping things moving and uh, collecting your questions. And I also wanted to mention that AgriLinks webinars are uh, produced and managed by the Feed the Future KDAD project, uh, which stands for Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development. So thank you very much to that team for helping to make these webinars happen. All right, it is time to uh, dive into the content and discuss a topic that is very fundamental to all agriculture and food security activities, uh, which is soil, soil types, soil variability, and the various inputs uh, that can help improve uh, soil prospects for smallholder farmers. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our three speakers today and then uh, pass it off to them. All right, so we have a great panel of speakers uh, during this webinar today. And first up, uh, is Amelia uh, Chirenstrom from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she is an assistant professor of public affairs and agricultural and applied economics. Uh, her research draws on insights from behavioral economics and employs econometrics, uh, field and lab experiments um, to study technology diffusion. So she will kick us off today. And then next up will be uh, Hope Mickelson who is an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Um, and uh, she uh, has her PhD in applied economics from Cornell. And her research uh, in the developing world centers on relationships among agriculture, poverty, and market institutions. She will be our second presenter. And uh, Carolina Corral uh, will be our third presenter. Um, she is with the Precision, Precision Agriculture for Development Kenya uh, project, which is also known as PAD. Um, and she has, uh, or she is, uh, has her MSc in economics from the University of Montreal and more than 10 years experience in applied economic research, um, managing projects in Latin America, Africa, and uh, many other locations. And uh, PAD, her organization, is a nonprofit with the mission to support smallholder farmers in developing countries with personalized agricultural advice through their mobile phones. So that is our panel. Um, but kicking off with a few introductory remarks is Michael Carter with the University of California, Davis, a professor of agricultural, agricultural and resource economics. 
uh, and the director of the See the Future Innovation Lab for Assets and Market Access, or the AMA Innovation Lab. So we would love to have uh, Michael unmute his, his line and kick us off uh, for this webinar. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Julie, and, uh, and thank you to everyone for joining us. I'll say just a very few words by way of introduction uh, for what we're about to hear. So the, the way I think about this event is, in a sense, what we're talking about is, is the green revolution that was not. So I suspect most of us have seen data on cereal yields and fertilizer use stretching from 1960 forward. Uh, and if you look at that kind of data, what you see is South Asia, East Asia, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, we're all at very similar levels in 1960. And then as you roll the clock forward, the other regions of the developing world show very sharp rates of increase in cereal yields matched by very sharp uh, rates of increase in the use of inorganic uh, uh, fertilizers. And so one of the questions has always been, what, what happened to the seed fertilizer revolution in sub-Saharan Africa? Why didn't, why didn't it happen uh, in the same way that it seems to have happened in most other, other parts of the world? Uh, economists, amongst others, have their own sort of favorite explanations. Uh, economists might focus on liquidity constraints or risk. I've always thought it's important to ask ourselves, what's, what's different? Why this sort of sub-Saharan African exceptionalism? One kind of perspective that's emerged from a number of, of, of people who study this in, intensively is that there's something different about African soils. So an extreme version of that uh, hypothesis would be that African soils just are not very fertilizer responsive. Organic matter is perhaps really low. There simply are not the preconditions, the biophysical preconditions, the agronomic conditions for the seed fertilizer revolution to work. Another possibility, and this really gets us to what we're going to talk about today, is it's perhaps not so much the average level of fertilizer responsiveness of soils, but rather the variability of soils that is the issue. So the studies we're going to look at today uh, share a common characteristic in, in that they all look at hyper, I'm going to call it hyper-local variation in soil quality. And they're really looking at a series of interrelated questions. So the first is how, how much of that sort of hyper-local soil variation is there? And does it matter in the sense that a farmer in, in one location uh, really has soils are sufficiently different than a nearby farmer such that a, a standardized uh, green revolution recommendation, use this much nitrogen, use this seed variety, is maybe just not going to work. So that's the first element we're going to, I, I think all three studies are going to talk to us about today. And the next thing is, what do you do about it? Uh, if there is this kind of hyper-local variation, what are the kinds of interventions that, that might be possible? Is, is simply the provision of information sufficient? Or are there other, uh, other kinds of matching interventions that need to be made such that uh, farmers can actually profitably adopt uh, of their own particular, if you will, variation of the seed fertilizer variation? So Amelia is going to be sharing information with us on a study in Western Kenya. Caro is talking about some work initially in Mexico, which is now spilling over in into Eastern Africa, and Hope will talk to us about work she and her colleagues have been doing in Tanzania. And I think our job here as an audience is, as we go through this material with them, is to sort of ask ourselves, what, if anything, can be done to, uh, to, to promote the uptake of the technologies which are there uh, and which seem to hold out such promise and yet which seem not to have been adopted in this environment of, uh, as we'll see, a, a fairly extreme soil heterogeneity. So without further ado on my part, Amelia, why don't we pass it over to you? And I look forward to the conversation uh, with all of us who have joined. All right. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning, everyone, or you know, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I've been asked to just remind participants that if you want to see the presentation up on the full screen, then you can click the four arrows in the top right-hand corner of your presentation display, and that'll sort of make it a full screen window. Um, and so I want to start off the morning with um, talking about some data that we collected in Kenya together with um, Tigameo Institute uh, in Nairobi. And I'm really excited to uh, see some of them present in um, 
and I don't know why the screen is moving um, in, in, the, in the chat today anyway. Um, so what I want to do is um, talk a little bit about what I think uh, the data has taught us about the level at which um, soil quality characteristics vary and what that variability means in terms of both how to think about what the optimal input package looks like, first of all, holder farmers, uh, in terms of how farmers' ability uh, to learn might about what is optimal for them, as Michael mentioned, sort of uh, varies with uh, the extent of soil variability, and also in terms of the extent to which this variability slows adoption of improved inputs for farmers. Now, I think that will set up Hope and Caro really nicely, because they're, the, they're then going to talk about ways in which uh, we can sort of leverage information about soils to maybe increase adoption about, um, of improved materials. So um, some of the reasons that we might care about soil heterogeneity, right? I think many of you listening would agree that um, increasing the use of improved germplasm and fertilizer could boost the yields and the welfare of rural households. And there are lots of smart and passionate people who work in the government sphere, uh, researchers, NGOs, who work on ways to increase adoption of these inputs. And common approaches include things like input subsidies, extension services, and you know, government-issued input recommendations. But it's really hard to provide good recommendations and trainings uh, when, in, when soils vary a lot. Right? Um, so one important question becomes sort of how low do we go? Right? How low do we need to go at what level do we have enough similarity that providing a single recommendation should suffice? So for a country like Kenya, are we talking about 10 agroecological zones for which we might want to make different recommendations? Are we talking about 100 uh, more? And so I want to start by looking at some maps and thinking a little bit about this issue, because at least I was quite surprised when we started digging into this data. and then. Uh, I'll move to talking a bit about what the consequences uh, might be for farmers of this type of variability. So to give you a sense, uh, let me show you some maps. So on the left-hand side is Kenya. Uh, the red zone there is the former province of Nyanza. Uh, it was a, an administrative unit. Um, and the right-hand side sort of zooms in on the part of this province that lies south of Lake Victoria, so south Nyanza. And this colorful map comes from the 2009 version of the Farm Management Handbook of Kenya. And so you can see that there's been a lot of careful work here going into defining different agroecological zones based on rainfall, the length of the growing season, et cetera, right? Um, I'm going to show you another map of the same region where um, the different colors and these different rectangles um, show different areas within which um, different fertilizer recommendations have been made, okay? Uh, and so within these different sections, you can sort of pull up a zoomed-in version and find a table within this handbook and look up fertilizer recommendations for that specific zone, okay? So this is partly to say that it's not as though local variability in the environment hasn't been considered before, but what if these are not still not local enough, right? Note the scale here, that this, this uh, rectangle on the right-hand side is sort of 20, you know, 10 to 20 kilometers across, okay? And so we're going to look at our data to kind of uh, think about whether or not there's important variability even within um, these types of zones. And so our data, um, these maps show the GPS locations of our sample farmers, and they were collected for a study on the socioeconomic impacts of a new maize hybrid. But as part of the data collection, we sampled the fields of 1,800 farm households and sent them to be tested, sent the soil samples to CropNuts, uh, which is an ISO-certified lab in Nairobi. And we obtained over 20 different measures, so ranging from pH, organic matter, um, a bunch of different nutrients and micronutrients, and the cation exchange capacity, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, so as you can see, we have a pretty broad geographical spread in our sample, but let me, for the sake of comparison, zoom in to South Nyanza again, roughly. Um, this map here 
um, shows our, the GPS locations of our different um, households in this area and shows a distribution of cation exchange capacity. Uh, it's often used as a measure uh, to gauge soil fertility. And um, sorry, my map is my, my presentation is moving. So if someone else is moving that, uh, that um, maybe avoid doing that. <laughs> but so cation exchange capacity is is important because it affects farmers. It affects optimum practices, and this is just one example. But for example, liming recommendations fertilizer efficiency, and even the optimal timing of fertilizer applications all vary with uh, soil CEC. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in even more and look at a couple of villages um, in our sample. And so the different dots here, the colors of those dots represent different ranges of cation exchange capacity. And this correlates with, as I said, different soil types, different um, optimum practices. And so note that across just a couple of villages here, we have fields that fall into both very low range, low, medium, and high ranges of CEC. And so uh, even within a village, um, soil quality can vary quite a bit. And so if you note the scale, it might actually be difficult because my presentation, we have some technical if difficulties. And so it's a little bit wonky, but bear with me. That um, bar in the lower right-hand side corner in that red rectangle um, shows a one kilometer um, scale. So this is the scale here is basically incredible variation within just a few kilometers of each other, right? And so um, even within a village, as I said, soil quality can vary quite a bit. I'm going to show some other examples of this. Um, this is across all of our 100 plus villages, the variation in cation exchange capacity again. And so each bar on this graph is a box plot. And if you can see it, there's a white line in the middle of each bar, which shows you the median CEC value in that village. Um, well, the height of the bars represent the amount of variability within that village, essentially. Okay, um, but there's also big differences between different villages in terms of how much variation there is. So if we zoom in on two villages that have the same median CEC, you can see that in one of these villages, a 25th percentile farmer looks very different from a 75th percentile farmer, whereas in the other village, the distribution is sort of much more compressed. And we can see the same thing for um, other soil characteristics. Um, for this graph shows pH. Um, this graph shows organic matter. And so you see lots of variability both between and within villages and in the extent of um, variability. So the logical next question here is obviously whether this matters for input recommendations and for optimal practices. And so in particular, um, does the optimal fertilizer recommendation vary at this sort of hyper-local scale? And might recommendations for a median farmer in a village potentially be misleading for other farmers? And certainly at the sort of, you know, 20 kilometer or regional scale. And so the short answer to the first question is that yes, um, it seems like the optimum Input, optimal input varies quite a lot within village. Um, our soil testing lab also provided each of our farmers with a recommendation for the optimal input um, application for a variety of fertilizers, and there are substantial differences within villages. These graphs show 20 random villages um, and the recommended level of DAP per acre for um, those samples. And so the two blue circles here show that for some farmers, the ideal application rate might be 20 kilograms per acre, and for others, it might be as much as 40, which may not sound like a lot, but it can have very important um, profit implications if you're a smallholder and you're deciding how to allocate a limited budget. Okay? Um, so we can also see this. We have the same graphs for a variety of fertilizers, but I don't want to bore you with that. Um, so we can also look at this in a different way. Um, by estimating production functions and, you know, slightly more advanced econometric techniques and try to estimate based on a panel of uh, three rounds of, of survey data what the returns to fertilizer look like and how they change with the underlying soil qualities and types. Um, on the right-hand side here, the graph, um, so we use a quadratic production, a generalized quadratic um, for those who are econometric geeks. Um, we have household fixed effects. And so 
on the you can see that on the left hand side for for certain levels of CEC, the average um, marginal benefit of adding another kilo of nitrogen is is substantial. Um, whereas for other ranges of CEC, it seems like on average the the returns to more nitrogen are quite low. Um, we have these graphs again for um, a lot of different soil conditions, but it seems like the returns to an additional kilo of nitrogen vary markedly with soil conditions. Now this could be because, um, and as I think Hope will talk about, other nutrients are more limiting in certain contexts, or because of acidity, or because of a variety of different issues, but in general, it does seem like the ideal fertilizer recommendation varies with soil quality. Okay. So to kind of loop back to the things we really care about, um, we sort of think about what, you know, whether this could be part of the reason that the adoption of improved inputs is so low in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so I have some other work showing that um, learning through social networks by farmers, um, you know, basically learning from their neighbors is substantially weaker in villages with more soil quality variation. Okay. So this is, somewhat logical, right? Because when soils vary more, the experience that one farmer has with improved inputs doesn't necessarily provide a good example for other farmers who may have a different soil type, um, as I showed you earlier. Um, and it does seem like farmers are acutely aware of this, um, of this issue. Um, they, because of the fact that they learn worse in more heterogeneous villages, we can sort of infer that um, one of the reasons for this reduced learning ability is, um, is that soils vary so much. And so this really suggests that um, the types of localized interventions and um, recommendations and very specific information um, that the next presenters are going to talk about can play a really important role. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to the next presenter. Hi. Hello. Um, thanks, Amelia. So this is Hope Michelson. I'm from the University of Illinois. And um, I'm, so I'm going it's, to, it's lovely to follow Amelia and Michael because they set up our work, I think, so well. And I think some of the things that we're doing can really complement what Amelia has just talked about. So um, as Michael noted, this is work that's been done in Tanzania. We're just finishing up. Um, and it's with a really big group of people that I want to acknowledge. So a whole team of soil scientists at um, uh, Sokoene University in Maragoro, as well as folks at Columbia, University of Florida, and now we have one researcher who's at Miguel. So, as Michael noted, and there's some, yeah? Hey, Hope, I'm sorry, Adam and sure. DC, can you just speak yeah. up a little bit, okay. please? You're a little hey, bit wait, faint. Let me turn Thank you, There's a back-end uh, air conditioner that might be making things worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Let me know if this doesn't if this doesn't sound better. Okay. Um, so as well, we could use okay. a little more oomph if you right. got it, okay. but if not, that's fine. We can live. Uh, folks, uh, Hope is presenting in a different location from us. You might just need okay. to turn off the sound on your computer. Um, Thank you. So as Michael noted, and as Amelia stressed, you know, there's this problem that many people have been thinking about for a long time, um, which is that mineral fertilizer use, as well as other uh, sort of advanced inputs, agricultural inputs has, has really lagged in sub-Saharan Africa, and we see an associated lag in crop yields, um, especially among small farmers. And so just to reiterate, right, there's sort of three reasons that we think soil variation can be important here if we find that it's, um, it's, that it's significant enough, right, that there's enough variation. Right? And the three reasons that, that we think about a lot, right, is that you're going to need sub-regional calibration of fertilizer and management recommendations, right? So these, so Tanzania in particular is not like Kenya, where you've got these sub-regional kind of carefully calibrated recommendations. Tanzania is making broader recommendations for um, for whole regions for maize cultivation, right? And and there's a number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa that have that kind of a strategy. And so if we find that there's enough soil variation and that that soil variation is meaningful agronomically we really need to think about how we're going to get recommendations to people that are appropriate. Right? And the, so the second point is related to something that Amelia has talked about and also thought about a lot, which is that if you've got this within village farmer heterogeneity, variation in soils, learning about technologies 
is going to be compromised in some ways, or it's going to be a bit different. And that's something that if you have an extension system, you're, want, you're going to want to think about pretty carefully. Right? So if you're in a place where you've got very similar soils, you might expect different kinds of learning dynamics, different kinds of spillovers among your farmers. Whereas if you're in a place where you've got a lot of variation, that process may not happen, or it may not happen as quickly. And the third piece, which I think about a lot in an associated project, is if you've got all of this important variation, you're going to have a demand for a, very, a, a wide variety of agricultural inputs, right? So in particular, fertilizer blends. And you're going to need well-capacity agricultural input supply chains to actually meet those needs, right? So they're going to have to be well-resourced. They're going to have to be able to supply the blends to the right places, to the right people. Um, and so some work that I have suggests that, at least in Tanzania, we may not be there quite yet. All right, so the three questions that I'm going to talk about um, are thinking about this localized variation. So I'll show you in Tanzania what we're seeing in this one region where we're working. And I'll show you that in a slightly different way than Amelia was talking about it. Um, <coughs> and then we, as a part of the intervention for this project, are providing information to farmers about their soils and specific management recommendations based on that the soil test. And then we're looking at what the effect is of that, of providing that information in a couple of different ways on what farmers decide to buy and then the yields that they're getting from it. Okay. And then I'll also, we're, we're beginning to think about the third question that Amelia also talked about, which is the how, lo how low should you go question. Right? So what's the optimal scale for soil testing? And the reason we're thinking about that is that in conversations with people that we're having who think about this on the policy side, the first question we get. Right? So do we need to test at the field level? Do we need to test at the village level? What's the right way to think about providing this information to farmers? So, <laughs> so just to explain the experiment that we're doing before I show you any of the results. So we're working in um, eastern Tanzania in Morogoro. And we tested the primary maize plots for 1,100 farmers, small-scale maize farmers. And so we, took, we randomly selected the villages and um, and there are two components to the treatment. So there's a plot-specific management recommendation. Right? So we, we tested their primary maize plot. And then, and I'll tell you how we did that in, on the next slide. And then we had management recommendations based on those test results. And there's also a voucher worth $40, um, which was redeemable for agricultural inputs. And that is the amount that it costs to, um, to buy the inputs currently recommended by the government for maize production in that region for half of an acre. That's how that number came about. So we took those two components of the treatment, and we have three treatment arms. So farmers either received the soil management recommendations, they got the management recommendations and the voucher, or they only got the voucher, right? So you can think about that as information only, information plus liquidity, or liquidity only. Um, and then we had a control group. Um, that's both within the villages and also separate villages that were control villages, so you can look at spillovers. Um, and they received the management recommendations as well. We tested their plus as well, but we received, they received them at end line, right? So you can see um, what happens to folks that <coughs> did get those things, but the people that didn't. So just a, a, a moment explaining what we're using um, to do the testing. So this is called the Soil.Kit. It was developed by Ray Weil from the University of Maryland. And the cost of the test uh, uh, using this kit, which gives you measures of CEC, pH, N, um, P, K, S, a uh, range of other parameters, um, is about $5 right now, although that doesn't include the time associated with, um, with the testing. So it's significantly less than a sort of wet lab measure. Also, this is um, uh, designed to be able to do be done in the field with the farmer. Um, so you also don't have that time lag that you often have um, between the testing and the provision of the information. We didn't do it like that because we wanted, we wanted to sort of have scale. Uh, and so we, we used the soil dot protocols, but we used them in the lab at Silk Running University. So if people have questions about that, I can answer it at the end. This is where our farmers are located. So the blue dots are treatment fields, our treatment farmers, and our red dots are control fields. Um, as I said, we're in eastern Tanzania in the Morogoro region, and you can see the, sort of the nice kind of uh, coincident coverage of the treatment and control groups. 
So I'll also show you, so this is the recommendation sheet. Um, you're getting the details right on this kind of an intervention are really, is really important. So um, this was a, a recommendation sheet given to farmers who were um, deficient in sulfur and nitrogen. Um, and it's in Swahili. Uh, Rex was provided to each farmer for both one acre and half of an acre. Um, so the cost of this packet was about 65,000 um, uh, uh, shillings at the time. And then here's a picture of what the voucher looked like. So it was an 80,000 um, shilling voucher. And one thing to note that people can ask about later is that they were allowed to just turn it in for cash. So if they turned it in for cash, they got 85% of the value of the voucher. <laughs> so let's talk about some results then. As I said, I'm going to show you things in a slightly different way than Amelia, and it's related to the way that we did the management recommendations from the soil testing. So, um, so I'll show them to you spatially, and then I'll show them to you in a, in a table form. So this is similar to the map that Amelia showed you with um, one difference. So each dot is a field. And then in the right side, the, the lower, lower right corner key, what we've got are the management recommendations according to specific combinations of nutrient deficiencies um, that came out of the soil testing. So the, the sort of um, the top one is farmers that were only deficient, only limited in nitrogen, um, and then farmers that were limited in nitrogen and potassium, and then you can go down from there. So you can think about as you get lower, um, th those fields are, are deficient in more, um, in more nutrients, right? So this is within 120 square mile area you see that fields exhibit eight different combinations of nutrient limitations. And you can also see that you know, within the villages, um, which have these sort of clusters of points, they're marked by triangles, but difficult to see, I think, um, that there's a lot of variation in what those specific combinations of nutrient limitations are. Right? And I, that's very important, because these nutrient limitations are related to the kinds of fertilizers you need to buy, the kinds of applications you need to make, when you make those applications, and the blends that you need to purchase. Right? So if you're thinking about what an extension service needs to think about, what a, you know, an input dealer needs to have on hand, that's a lot of variability in a practical sense to be, um, to be trying to, um, to sort of meet the demand of. Okay. So the other way to think about this, the other way to present this is as a table. So there's <coughs> a thousand um, fields here in the table, and it's the same information. But what I'm showing you is the nutrient deficiency and then the number of farms and the share of farms in the far right column. And what I want you to note, the additional piece of information here is, well, first, the, just the breakdown across, the, across the, the different limitations. And you can see sulfur is highly limiting for the majority of farmers in our, um, in our sample. What's interesting, so the government recommended application for maize grow in the region is NP, which I've highlighted in red. And so that means that, that that's uh, appropriate to the nutrient limitation of only five farmers in our sample. And in particular, the government's not saying anything about sulfur, um, and that's a very highly limiting um, uh, nutrient for nearly all of the farmers in the sample. So that's <coughs> an important thing to think about. OK, so what I'm showing you in this graph, then, is we're going to get into the results of the effects of the intervention. So remember, there's three treatment groups, voucher, so getting some liquidity, um, the recommendation, and then the combination of those things. Okay. So what this is showing you is just in a discrete way, what did people buy if they got those different, if they were assigned to those different treatment arms, right? So um, one thing to note, so the first bullet point there, um, is that only eight of the farmers in our sample had applied mineral fertilizer at baseline, so extremely low baseline usage rates. And that was, very, that was surprising even to us. That was lower rates than we expected to see. So at M9, we've got about 250 farmers buying fertilizer. And farmers who are receiving the vouchers <coughs> or the recommendations plus the vouchers are the ones where we're seeing some movement, right? So the ones who just got the information um, alone without that liquidity infusion, we're not seeing um, uh, making any purchases, at least yet. Right? So this is something Michael and I talked about a couple days ago. So, um, so you could look at that slide and you could say, OK, well, it looks like you know, farmers are buying either urea and sulfur or urea and DAP or only urea. And a lot of farmers are buying only urea. right? So if you're giving this information and these vouchers to farmers and they're just going out and buying urea, how important is that? How useful is that to actually solving the nutrient limitations that they have on their fields? And so 
one thing to note here, which is interesting and important, is that there is a special value of the information. The farmers that got the vouchers and the information were much more likely to buy fertilizers that related to their nutrient deficiencies. So in particular, as I said before, sulfur was a, was a primary limitation for the, a majority of these farmers. And so what I have down here in the, in the small table is just a linear probability model <coughs> regressing um, the, the interactions of being sulfur deficient with your treatment right, status. And, and you can see that the big effect here, right, so you're much more likely to actually buy ammonium, ammonium sulfate fertilizer if you were given information that you were sulfur deficient and you had the voucher and recommendation tree. Okay? So that's telling us potentially some information that information can help close those farm specific nutrient deficiency gaps. So I think that's, a, that's important to know. Okay, so now I'll just, I'm going to show you two graphs that, that are the effects. So we talked about what the sort of discrete effects are on buying or not buying fertilizer. So this is how much fertilizer you bought if you were, um, if you were in the different treatment arms of the, of the intervention. And then the next graph, will, I'll show you yield effects. So <laughs> here what you're seeing is um, on the y-axis is the kilos of mineral fertilizer. So we're just lumping all the mineral fertilizer together here. And on the x-axis, the different treatment arms. And so you can see that the big effects that we're seeing, so people who, were, um, who received the REC and the voucher bought about 12 to 13 kilos of mineral fertilizer. Right? We also see an effect on the voucher only. They bought about seven. Those are statistically different from each other. Right? But as you can expect from the previous slide, there's almost nothing on recommendation only. And then correspondingly, uh, we see an effect, although it's a small effect, on the yields, uh, the maize yields of the group that got the recommendation and the voucher. Um, so our yield measure is pretty noisy, um, and we're doing some work to see if we can control for some of that variation in a better way. Um, but so right now we're only seeing that effect map into that group. So in terms of preliminary conclusions, there's a few things that I want to stress. So we do see considerable variation, I would say, in soil nutrient deficiencies in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. Um, <coughs> and, and our results clearly demonstrate that the national level of fertilizer recommendations are not serving a number of farmers, at least in this region. Right? So vouchers alone seem to move farmers to purchase mineral fertilizer, but it's information plus vouchers that seem to be important for closing farm-specific nutrient gaps. But it's important to note also that those financial constraints are significant. So information provision alone is not yet changing investment. That doesn't mean that it wouldn't in the future. Farmers could be holding back and waiting to see what's happening, but we don't see that in, at the end line, which is the year after the information is provided. We also see pretty limited information flow. I didn't present these results, <coughs> but control farmers living in the treatment villages, right? so looking to see whether or not those guys are different from control farmers living in control villages, we don't see any difference for them. So it's not that farmers yet are sort of swapping this information around. Part of that could be related to what Amelia has suggested um, and what Kyla Munchi, Munchi has found, that there's a lot of, um, you know, that learning can be really limited in highly variable um, uh, uh, villages. Um, we don't see a lot of an effect on yields. Um, you know, there's some, something to talk about here in terms of fertilizing maize and the profitability of doing that. Um, and I, and I, you know, I want to stress this, this idea that areas with evidence of agronomically important variation in soil quality, it may be important to think about farm level soil testing and management recommendations. <coughs> but, so that brings me to my last point in the last slide I'm going to show you. Um, also, in terms, sorry, in terms of future work, I think there's interesting questions about how these dynamics change over, change over time, how, what learning looks like across farmers, and whether effects stay, whether they increase, attenuate. So Cara is going to talk about some of that. Uh, those questions in her. So the, the last slide that I want to leave you with is <coughs> we're also thinking about this question of the optimal scale for soil testing. We're thinking it, about it at this point in more of a, um, in, in sort of a, like a statistical way where we're just trying to think about, okay, what are the places that have the most variation and can we predict which places have the most variation based on observable sort of structural characteristics that we can get from publicly available data. So that's what we're thinking about. The idea being that there's variability in the variability. Right? And this, uh, understanding that variability can be very important for figuring out where to deploy the resources for more field level testing versus where to maybe um, spend less resources 
and to do testing at the, the village level or the cluster level. All right, so this is um, some initial work that we're doing where we're looking at the electrical conductivity. <coughs> and, and what this is suggesting, so on the left we've got the actual measures, this is similar to the box plots that Amelia was showing you, of, uh, of the soil electrical conductivity. And on the right, what we've taken is we've taken our data and just randomly put the farmers into villages, right? Um, and then we're comparing what those distributions look like. Um, so <clears throat> what this is telling you and what we're seeing across a number of the measures is that there is something structural, right, within at the village level, right? So, so the, the, the values tend to be tighter, the variability tends to be smaller at the village level in our data than it is if you just randomly group the villages together. So that, that, I think that's hopeful in some sense because it, it suggests that there's some kind of structure that might allow us to, in some places, not have to do the expensive um, kind of field level testing for um, uh, assessing variability. So I'm going to pass it off to Carol, and thanks very much. <coughs> good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So thank you so much to Emilia and Hope. You have done half of my presentation, so I can go very fast now. Um, so thank you for that. Like I'm going to present to you um, <coughs> our research that is was done in Mexico. Uh, the work was done with, together with uh, Tarishini from the World Bank, Apache Mahaman from UC Berkeley, and Enrique Feira from Gam in Mexico. I want to mention two very important actors that I don't mention at the beginning. One is Dr. Javier Castellano. He's our soil scientist. He has been working for us for the past three years. He's now helping me in our work with Precision Agriculture for Development in Kenya. And at the same time, you will see how important was the role of the agricultural extension uh, workers and, they were, and, and also the agro dealers. So our work is uh, very similar from very similar grants that, uh, that the, the two presentations you have just seen. And basically, we start with this question about we have all these amount of, as Michael was saying at the beginning, there is all this technology that was developed uh, in different research centers that is working to increase yields, but however many of it happen, and we don't see that a small farmers are adopting these technologies. So um, one of these reasons could be this, what we are discussing today, which is the heterogeneity on the soil. So we wanted to focus in Mexico because uh, uh, although there are like many regions in the country that they have like yields comparable to the U.S. standard, um, there are many other regions in the country that actually are very close similar to the productivity uh, that we observe in Africa, like maybe not so much higher. For example, in Tlaxcala, where we did the study, the average productivity of our farmers is about two tons per hectare, which is not that far away from Africa. So, what is our project? We want to better understand what is, uh, where are the costs of the heterogeneity, uh, and we want to focus on soil quality. We want to use a very high quality uh, data on soil analysis. I will talk very briefly about uh, what are the considerations we need to to think when we are talking about soil analysis, there's a whole world behind that. And also using this information from soil analysis and high quality data from measurements and, and surveys on these farmers, we want to develop interventions that actually from the beginning, from the design, they should be successful. Like uh, basically we try to develop interventions that are so well uh, sounded on agricultural theory, but also in behavioral theory that from the beginning we expect that if farmers try them, they are going to be successful. So what we focus on is, as you have just seen like evidence from other countries in Africa, we see the same. We perform 3,000 chemical analysis using wet chemistry uh, with a very renowned lab, uh, laboratory in Mexico. We see exactly the same that Hope and Emilia saw. Uh, large variation both within and across clusters. We have 27 clusters of, of localities 
in Tlaxcala, and we see high variations in uh, micronutrients, those are nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. We don't see that much variation in micronutrients, and I think it's interesting, and probably if there is someone in the audience um, who has expertise on that, maybe that person can put comments about that. And, and we know that if we have high soil variation, we, uh, we cannot expect that uh, input packages will perform the same, okay? Same, same problem, we have short things, okay? So now I will tell you what we did to solve the problem, like from the implementation issue. So we observed this problem. So what we did is like we performed more than um, thousands of soil analysis, and based on the results of those soil analysis, we provided individual and average recommendations. So I'm going to talk a little more in detail uh, in a second about what is an average recommendation. We also provided income grants, and we provided flexible and unflexible. So in the unflexible grant, basically we told the farmers that they could pick um, an input package that was a fertilized recommendation, but also we provide the machinery. And we said, first you have to do, uh, you have to get your planting package right, and then move forward into the second package. And one of the things, the reason for that is like, especially in Tlaxcala, only 10 to 12 percent of our farmers were applying fertilizers at planting. And the reason for that is because La Scala has like a lot of different um, weather risks. So they face, for example, drought, they face, for example, frost. Uh, and so a way that farmers have adapted with time for that is to wait and to apply the first round of fertilizers. Where that happens is like for the first 30 days, uh, the plant is not receiving the right nutrients, and obviously that has like a high impact in the total yield. And the third uh, part of the implementation was provided as other extension services to the farmers. We combined this into four treatments and a control arm. I'm not going to talk about the treatment now. I want to actually go more in detail to explain you where were like the different parts of the intervention that we had to solve at each step. And then when I show you the results of that option, uh, I will explain you a little bit more of why we did that evaluation design. So for the input implementation, um, we did something that is different, and I haven't seen that, that much in the literature. Uh, in order to uh, calculate these input recommendations, we actually we set up a, a yield target. So, and the reason for this is, is, is target, it was because like, sometimes when you're thinking what input recommendation you should work with, like, the first question is how much you want to produce. And then in order to get to that uh, optimal, then you subtract the amount of nutrients that are supplied by the soil, and then you provide a recommendation out of it. So, um, the, all this calibration model was done by Fertilab. Uh, which is an renowned the, the lab that I was talking in Mexico is in webcam. And for the people that are like from economics, basically for econ when we're talking to economists, what is behind all these recommendations is just like a Leon Tef production model for agronomists. This is like the EF law of minimums, which does mean that your expected productivity depends on the nutrients that you're lacking the most. We also recommend doses for urea, DIP, potassium chloride, and also include micronutrients because we also have high deficiency. There is a lot of there is a large body of literature from the agricultural scientists that basically are like talking about these micronutrients. You don't seem to need like that many amounts of kilograms, but actually they have like high impact on the uh, on yields at the end of the day. We also provide the information about prices, quantities, and total cost for each input package. That was called the shopping list. In the recommendations, we also provide information about how much and, and the price they should use. But we also compare that information to their own use of fertilizers. So, I don't know, someone moved something. Okay, let me, I don't know what happened. Uh, okay, it's a move. So one thing that is very important about fertilizer application, as I said a second ago, is the timing of the fertilization. So that's something that 
uh, we so evidence I'm not going to present it in here so what's happening is like the plant really needs the fertilizers to be applied at different so, uh, at different growth stages if the farmers don't do that uh, and they apply it maybe later uh, they are not going to see the same impact so we were talking a lot about the timing of, of the fertilization and we were talking about it in terms of the number of leaves the plants have and the number of days after uh, planting. So another part of the recommendations was to provide, actually we were recommending the use of precision sowing drills uh, and, we were, and we explained to the farmers that it was very important that, that there was the right space in between seeds in order to guarantee that once the fertilizer is applied, actually the plants can uh, try to avoid the plants competing within each other. And the second thing, that, the last thing that we also recommend, we didn't support with, with the ground, was the use of survey sites. Which I think is very important to mention, it's like sometimes when we're talking about all these problems, we forget to mention like, you know, what could be negative externalities of the use of fertilizers, and which is one of them. So, the Newton fertilizer recommendation, um, we saw that there is like substantial variation both in the soil analysis and depending in, in which localities that was translated into a variation to recommendations. In some other localities it was not because it depends like on, on many different factors uh, that we took into account for the calculations. Um, once we have this, translate, uh, this translation into the, the fertilizer recommendations, one of the things that we realized is that farmers that were using with the same amount of money that we're investing in urea, they could be doing much better if they were to apply a more diverse uh, fertilizer package. So um, when I was talking about this average soil analysis, so we have this situation where the government, for example, uh, in, in Kenya, they are offering blanket recommendations. The same is true in Mexico. The government is offering blanket recommendations to the farmers. So, um, uh, what we are trying to do is try to improve this blanket recommendation and trying to be more precise about what is the level of aggregation of soil analysis. So what we did is out of clusters that they would depend on size, there were like about between 5 to 10 kilometers, square kilometers. We were going to, first what we did is basically we, we calculate the average soil analysis uh, for that particular cluster and then we provide average recommendations based on this average soil analysis. So what we find from out, out of that is that the blend end up being a little bit cheaper than, than the customized, um, that the individual that take the blend based on the individual soil analysis. The reason for that is because VIP, which is like one of the main components of the blend, and is more expensive, that there was some variation we were calculating that. And then finally, we work with agro dealers to actually mix, like perform these physical uh, mixes. In theory, you don't need that. Like you could have farmers actually, uh, farmers can, can do their own blend just by buying the different, um, the different fertilizers. The reason why we did it is because we wanted to be sure that the blend was performed in the right amount. Um, because we were trying to see, we were like, we were trying to calculate where were the, um, the returns to these mixes. So this is a map of Tlaxcala. So Tlaxcala is a very small state, it's close to, to Mexico City. And one of the things that is very interesting about the soils in Tlaxcala is that we have this big mountain called La Malinche, and all our localities that are planting maize are actually surrounded, you cannot see it in the map, but this is a small white area uh, in, in between the green area. And depending on the size of the mountain that your plot is located, the salts actually are expected to change a lot, and the same is true for the height that these plots are located. So this is one of the poorest states in Mexico. 88% of this is rainfall dependent. And in our sample, uh, our sample was like pretty much uh, farmers. Forty percent of our sample have not finished primary school. The and the land tenure is smaller than in other regions. 
So what are our results? We make all these efforts to try to understand all this agricultural CRG. We got the economists to think through all this uh, information, shopping lists, uh, prices. We were talking about efficiency to farmers. We were talking about the quality of the fertilizers to farmers. So what do we see? So we see that for 2015, that was the year that the intervention took place, we see the farmers did where we asked. Uh, so, for example, what we see is like we recommended less urea. Yes, they did less urea. We recommended a little bit uh, less of DIT. Yes, they did a little bit less of DIT. We see that there are adoption in potassium chloride that they were not using before. We see adoption on the potassium chloride. And overall, we see that they use less fertilizer, no more. And however, when we look at self-reported yields, uh, we see that actually um, that we were seeing increases between 16 and 72 percent. So the first question that you will have uh, about this table is, yes, but you didn't reach the 4.5 4 uh, ton yield, Caro. Yes, it's true. Because after all that effort, we got a drop that lasted about 30 days. So this research shows that even on, on, uh, under a very bad drought, all the treatments were performing better. So what is the difference between treatments that I have not explained and I promise to explain you now? Is, so treatment one was the treatment that was forced to use precision machinery at planting, but we provided personalized recommendations and blends for that particular block. People who were in treatment two were people who were forced to use the precision machinery and planting, but they were provided with average input packages, okay, but with support for them. Actually, our grant only cover the first uh, the machinery, the first package, and a small part of the second package that they use for top dressing. Treatment three is the most interesting one for us because in treatment three we provide the information to the farmers, but they could do whatever they wanted. So they could use the precision machinery for planting plus the fertilizer recommendation uh, for planting, and or they could uh, use the money to exchange it for only fertilizer blend, or they could even go and change it for whatever they want at the agrobat. So it could be uh, just urea, just DAP, just whatever they wanted. And in treatment four, they had all the training the rest of the farmer had. They have recommendations that were average, but they didn't receive any financial support. So um, what we see is that obviously the impact is coming from, it seems to, to be the case that the grant is helping for people for adoption. Um, but also that is translated into yields or self-reported yields at the end of the period. Yeah. What is important in here, and that's something that we want you, uh, want you to know more, is like, well, yes, yeah, so in the first year that we provided all the support, we were helping them to get these mixed plans, we were doing like all these calcul uh, calculations to get the right plan for them. Did they actually all these efforts translate it into practice to seek? Because that's one of the main questions. So it's like, do we care about what they do the first season by trying, or do we care about them maintaining these practices in the future? So in the second year, they did not receive any any grants. They did not receive more information than the one that received it. However, we keep following them to try to understand their investments. And we, and we collected information for practices. So the next is what I'm going to show you is the result for the year after intervention. So what do we see? The first thing that we see is that the people who were allowed to choose, they actually stick. We, we see a statistical significance of a, a higher a statistical significance in RNs to practices, so, which we thought it was very interesting. So not only we see higher take up of our recommendations the first year, meaning they follow our advice, even they didn't have to. Uh, but in the second year, other ones are adopting um, that, that are adopting these technologies. So that for us is more like a sign that is on something sort of behavioral, um, uh, behavioral that we might have by just allowing people to choose whatever they want. Like probably we were like instead of forcing them, like if we were the government, this is the package. Um, 
that we see is that the sign of like actual like choosing makes a difference for adoption. And this is beyond agricultural theory because the packages were the same. So we see that, for example, say that we see adoption of these sewing machinery that is quite extensive. We see the kids having adoption on that. We see adoption of fertilizer at, at sewing is higher also for this group. And also we see higher adoption. All the treatments are using uh, more herbicides, in, but we see the higher impact in treatment three, the ones we were able to choose. Um, and then the next slide shows, for example, we don't see any change in fertilizers use, but we do uh, see change in smaller practices that actually make the their use of the fertilizer more efficient as covering the fertilizers right up. And all the treatment groups, they have self-reporting information that they, they tried to follow our recommendations, they keep them and they keep using them. And, and also they, they desire to use this brand that is called Yara. Uh, the reason why we were using this brand in particular is because we were very worried about that, that the recommendations itself, uh, like need one, one reason why we want the recommendations to actually, like we, we think they might or not might, might not be successful is the quality of the fertilizer. So we wanted to control that using a uh, 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 renowned brand of fertilizers that we could guarantee the other concentration as well. So as conclusions is, uh, yes, so we see that all these efforts of providing farmers with localized information, agricultural services, agro-dealer coordinations, and income grants uh, did help to, for adoption. We see a uh, high take up in grants with human arts, which means things like, especially of, as Hope was saying, it's like, yes, probably farmers still need support, so it's not only about information. And, but something very interesting is that we don't see differences in take up of these packages because we announced the farmers, this is the package based on your individual soil analysis. And then we were very honest with the farmers who received the average recommendations. We don't see any differences. So for farmers, it didn't seem to matter to try. And, and we also provide um, in, uh, so yeah, income grants are still a problem. But what we think that is very important is and farmers saw the results of all these efforts we did to try to get very sandy recommendation that will work for their, uh, for them to see these results, these yields, actually help them to be more convinced on, on, on adopting these practices the next year. And, and the good thing about these recommendations is that we were trying to move them from efficiency because all the recommendations, as I said before, were based on, we collected all the information on how much money the farmers were spending on our ocean fertilizers and using that money we we made these recommendations to so say like you were uh, budgeting different. So uh, now we are doing our last run of surveys to see if we on top of seeing adoption on the second year we also we would like to see results on yields but we don't have those results yet. So um, and that's the end. Thank you very much. All right, wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, we've had a number of questions come in, and so I'm gonna go ahead and run through um, a few questions for each of our presenters. I, I see we've got some extra slides here. Are these mostly for reference for our participants? There we go. Um, uh, so to all our participants, if you'd like to download the uh, PowerPoint presentation, it is already posted on the AgriLinks event page uh, for this event. And I'll ask one of our um, uh, KDAD team members here to post the link to the event page to make sure that you all know where to pick up the PDF of this PowerPoint presentation. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into some of the questions that have come through. Um, one interesting one that might be most targeted to 
uh, Amelia or Hope, came in from Odipo Asano. To what extent is the soil variation attributed to natural differences? And to what extent could it be attributed actually to managerial differences in either Kenya or Tanzania? Um, and also he tacked on which crops are most sensitive to the soil variations. Um, but I think the crux is uh, how much the managerial differences affect soil variability. You want to, Amelia, do you want to take a crack at that or first? Sure. I'm happy to uh, give, it, give it a shot. I can't speak to Tanzania. But um, the... Thanks, Julie. Um, so this is Amelia talking. Um, the, it really depends on which characteristics we look at. Um, so certain soil characteristics, like uh, the cation exchange capacity, are actually very, very difficult to alter and have much more to do with the soil type that you have. It's actually it's notoriously difficult to alter your CEC. Um, for other things like pH um, and, and, you know, all the limiting nutrients, of course, it, it varies a lot um, based on what type of fertilizers people have used in the past. And so managerial practices will matter a lot. And so basically the answer is um, both. <laughs> um, in terms of which crops are most sensitive, this is, I'm not an expert on this, so I will hope that somebody else, um, that somebody else is. <laughs> Um, so I can I can add to the the first part of the question. So that's something that we're really interested in that we're trying to understand actually. So we're pulling together um, data that includes management, and also as I mentioned in the presentation, some of these um, you know sort of easily available observable characteristics, right? So like the slope, the soil texture and type. Um, the, the sort of the altitude of the of the field, and what we're trying to do is to to look at the variation within particular geographic areas and see based on those kinds of observable, pretty immutable characteristics, you know how much of the variation can we explain, right? Um, so the assumption would not necessarily be that anything unexplained would be based on management, but you know as a way to sort of start pulling out maybe how much of the variation could be explained locally based on some of those more structural characteristics. I will say, you know, we work really closely with soil scientists, and I gave a version of this presentation to a room full of soil scientists, which was terrifying, but interesting. And, um, and their general assessment was sort of conditional on soil type, a lot of it they think is management. I, I don't think I'm misstating what they said, but they, their assumption was, and this is actually um, due in large part to management. And you know, when they say management, they're thinking broadly about that. You know, so based on, um, for example, just like con years of continuous cultivation, right? So how long has the field been in um, in continuous cultivation? Um, so I think it's a really important question, and uh, it is one that we're trying to think about. Great, thank you so much, Hope and Amelia. Um, Hope, as long as you're on the line, another question had come in from you from, uh, or for you from Donald Greenberg. The financial return to increased fertilizer usage could be negative, even with farm-specific recommendations. Isn't that a more fundamental issue than I mean, that's a one great, time effect? Great on the question. Voucher? And that, you know, I think one thing that was missing from, um, you know, our, our presentation, our, our, our analysis so far. Um, is thinking about those economic returns, right? Um, so Michael has done some work on this and looking at, you know, what the effects are after a subsidy concludes on what people continue to do. Um, I, I do think that that's pretty instructive because people are making choices about, um, you know, what looks profitable to them and where it seems um, sensible to deploy their investments once a subsidy is gone, but they may have learned about the input. Um, but maybe I'll let Michael address that, given that he's got some research relevant to that topic. Would you like me to jump in and say just a word on that? Yeah, that would be fantastic if you're willing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've seen several comments on, on subsidies because they really jump out of, across these studies as, as playing a role. So Hope was just referring to a study that we did in Mozambique 
<clears throat> where we followed farmers two years after a once-off voucher coupon, and, and sort of the part of the idea was that if fertilizers aren't really profitable, of course farmers will adopt them um, when when the fertilizer is basically free or highly subsidized. But then once uh, once the once the subsidy goes away, you wouldn't imagine they would keep doing it. In the particular case of Mozambique, and I have to since we're talking heterogeneity, I want to I want to emphasize the particular case. This was in the central region of, uh, in Manica province in Mozambique, we actually found very strong uh, and, and persistent effects and in, that indeed uh, individuals who received the voucher treatment continued to use much higher levels of fertilizer. And it was even uh, the impact of the program were even visible in, in roughly 10 percent increases in household living standards uh, two years after the voucher coupon intervention had taken place. So. You know, I, I think it's a great question. I think Amelia showed us some information that was showing that I think she was showing us net profitability numbers and was showing that for, if I got, if I understood her figure correctly, it was showing that for roughly half to two-thirds of the farmers, the fertilizers, the estimated returns actually were such that they would be profitable. But for the other 40 percent or whatever it was, probably not. So I don't know if Amelia, maybe you want to say a quick word on interpreting your results that you had in that sense. Uh, yeah, sure. I think um, it again. It depends a little bit on um, on what characteristics you look at and so on. But yeah, I would say that overall we find fairly low returns to to fertilizer actually, um, but that they do vary with with characteristics. And I think for the, there's certainly a proportion. I think you interpreted the figure correctly. Um, for a portion of the sample, um, it looks like. Fertilizer is profitable, and this is for just one kilogram of, of nitrogen, right? So this is not speaking more broadly to perhaps um, other types of fertilizers. So as Hope discussed, it may be the case that certain other nutrients are more limiting, um, in which case just applying more nitrogen may not um, make that big of a difference. But, but yeah, uh, there's certainly, um, I, I would say that our results support this idea that um, the, the type of fertilizer is going to matter for profitability and um, and to speak a little bit more broadly to the question of profitability not only of subsidies but of um, you know soil testing and all of those things um, there's you know there's a trade-off there also temporally right um, if if subsidies are such that you have to continue um, providing liquidity for farmers then soil tests that provide farmers with better information about what types of nutrients they should apply um, could be more um, efficient, right? Because um, the farmers can keep that information. I'm sure you need to update the, the soil test at some point, but they may not need them um, sort of forever. Um, they, they may just need a one soil test every X years um, versus at least, you know, the government of Kenya is providing fairly frequent and continuous subsidies as our other African countries. So um, yeah, I think there's there's definitely a lot um, to think about and this is a really important discussion and a good question. So. I, I guess one sort of final note on this is in the context of our study, right, the dominant missing nutrient was sulfur, right? That was really important. And so but the package that includes sulfur, sulfur ammonium, um, is actually cheaper for farmers than the recommended package by the government, right? And so, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about the fact that if farmers are following the government recommendation, which granted in our Tanzania sample they weren't, um, you know, you could actually find some cost savings by recalibrating what the purchase is, um, you know, to better reflect what the specific nutrient deficiencies are of the farmer. So I think that's related to something that Amelia is suggesting. Excellent. Thank you all for your responses and support to that question. Um, a, a few questions came in uh, during uh, Caro's presentation as well. And one I thought was interesting from uh, Jennifer Cisse. Uh, in the different contexts um, about which you spoke, uh, Carolina, uh, to what extent can the variation in yields be explained by soil heterogeneity in the absence of interventions? And perhaps another way of putting that is what assumptions can we make about soil variability when we observe yield differences? 
Thank you for the question, Jennifer. So, um, I don't remember on the top of my head, uh, but so when we run it, I think that, you know, so differences in our first scenarios, we're explaining up to 15 variation in the yield, but don't take it for granted. Actually, I need to go back to look at that number. We run it like, uh, it was part of what was building the recommendations for us, but it was pretty high. Like it could, it could explain like it, it was very in line of what Amelia was saying with her CC. Um, it's just like we not only use CC, we're also using like, you know, organic matter uh, because, um, and we also were using like uh, things that Hope was saying. Like for example, the slope is super important. We are working in a mountainous region also was super important. So, and we could explain a, a lot of the yield variation. So, going back to the questions that we had before, if that is true, that is actually more supportive of the idea of understanding new fertilizer recommendation better. So, life is not only about urea. No, so yes, no, no plant can survive without nitrogen. But when we are talking about changes in yields, we we need to start talking about other other inputs, and especially in Mexico, we're through the micronutrients, uh, especially bottom and uh, sink. If I don't remember it correctly, uh, they they were explaining a lot of the variation in yield. So, uh, and that's when we need to start talking more with the economy. I don't know if I answer your question. Sorry. Uh, no, thank you very much. Um, going back to Amelia, uh, there was some discussion about uh, what farmers know and, and what farmers are communicating uh, to each other about soil, soil variability. Uh, so a question came in, how aware are farmers of local differences within the soil? And do they have a sense of whose soils are similar to theirs and whose are different? Um, it may actually not be that helpful to share information between farmers if there really is a ton of variability between different farmers' fields. Um, so in other words, could you dig into that a little bit more about how variability really affects spillover communication? Um, and, and, yeah, yeah certainly. So that's a great question, and I love it. Um, it's, I find this fascinating. Um, so. It's my sense that farmers are quite aware of these differences. So in a social network study, um, I look specifically at um, sort of farmers' communications about uh, a randomly introduced new technology and find that um, the extent to which uh, they're sort of willing to learn from other people's experiences varies with the amount of heterogeneity in that village, soil quality heterogeneity, okay? So that, just first off, sort of suggests that they're they're quite aware of, of the type of, of, of the amount the amount at least of variability. Um, other things to support that are that as part of the social network study, um, I collected data on um, whose soils uh, they think are most similar to theirs, and I have yet to dig into. Um, I'm trying to think of a good way to measure it actually, but to to think about exactly, um, you know. How to, how to use their answer to that question, but um, interestingly, in villages where there was more soil quality heterogeneity, um, farmers mentioned fewer other farmers as having similar soils to theirs, okay? And so that is, it's still just um, suggestive, but it does suggest that farmers um, have some awareness of, um, of, of whose soils are similar to theirs. Furthermore, um, we asked uh, several questions about um, sort of observables, you know, what type of soil do you have, how fertile is it, et cetera, a few different questions. And um, we can explain quite a lot of the variability in some soil characteristics, especially things that are, that change less over time. So CEC, that's one of the reasons I like it as a measure is because it um, stays fairly constant um, and is, doesn't change in response to management practices. And so we can explain a lot, like almost 60% of the variation in um, measured cation exchange capacity with three or four different um, farmer stated questions about their soils. So that to me suggests that it's not a perfect prediction, of course, but it suggests that there's um, 
quite a lot of local knowledge about, about these issues. And so it does also suggest that if we wanted to um, sort of spread information via social networks, we should really only be trying to do that in places where people are similar enough to each other, because otherwise either we'll spread the wrong information because the median farmer recommendation is not appropriate for others, or we won't spread anything at all because we're trying to get a bigger bang for our buck, but um, we really, you know, farmers just won't learn anything from that information because they don't believe it because they know that their soils are different. So, great question. Um, Thank you so much. Um, and as long as I have uh, you on the line, there was a quick clarifying question that came in from Dick Tinsley. How readily is fertilizer in Tanzania and Kenya uh, available? Do farmers have to get any extension approval to obtain fertilizer? Um, there aren't any barriers, at least not in Kenya. You can buy it. And in fact, I have a team in the, in the field right now doing surveys with agri-dealers and everyone in local areas who sell fertilizer. And, during peak season, you can even obtain fertilizer at the supermarket and at the hardware store and just about everywhere, which is terrible for my fertilizer survey because <laughs> a lot more observations, a lot more people to interview than I thought, but it's super interesting. So the difference is, I mean, there may not be high quality fertilizer, there may not be the type of fertilizer or the uh, manufacturer that you want. So there's or, as Caro mentioned, the, the appropriate micronutrients may not be in the fertilizer. And so there's a lot of different um, limitations. But um, just strictly speaking, getting fertilizer is easy um, if you have the money. So this is Hope. I can, I can chime in on that. Yeah, it's a little bit different, I think, in Tanzania. Uh, very good to know. I think two dimensions to think oh, about ahead, that Hope. are important. Um, so, um, so one is... You know, we have that, it's like a gradient of, um, uh, of what, nutrient limitations for the farmers, right? So if you need just nitrogen, you can get that almost anywhere. You know, even in Tanzania, um, which has a, I think, less sophisticated, less developed market system um, for inputs than Kenya, you know, we just completed a big study in, you know, in the tertiary markets year-round, you can get urea and MPK. Once you start needing things like, um, the you know sulfur blends for fertilizer. You've got it looks like you have to go to the closest sort of regional capital maybe to to get that. So you have to go to Morogoro or Ifakara. If you need something that's going to address like an NPKs limitation, then you're going to have to figure out how to get that from DAR, right? So the complexity of the blend is definitely um, you know harder to fill the further out you get in the rural area, at least in Morogoro. And then the second dimension of this, which Amelia just alluded to, and she and I both have research on, um, ongoing on this, is the quality of the fertilizer which is available in markets, right? So there's some very interesting and I think extremely important questions about how good the fertilizer is that's available in those markets, right? So whether or not it actually has the nutrient content that it's supposed to have based on the manufacturing standard. Um, and so, um, you know, Amelia and I are both doing work uh, to assess that and to try to understand, you know, where are the failures of these um, systems happening, these marketing systems happening, and, you know, why are we seeing these kinds of um, poor quality inputs in markets? Because we do see that there's a lot of missing nitrogen, for example, in the fertilizer that's being sold in markets. So I think thinking about the complexity of the blend and the quality of what you can get is really critical, you know, not just thinking about, you know, where you can actually, you can get an input. Just one thing to ask there, Hope, uh, can I add something more? Yes, yeah, so you. now that we're working, like, uh, for fighting Kenya, so. like, I can tell you for the last two seasons, uh, one of the things that we observe is true that uh, fertilizers uh, are we are expecting for them to be available, but we were tracking the on bi uh, weekly basis the stock of the agovets that were working for us because we had a coupon to measure adoption. And actually, we see we saw a lot of uh, fluctuations. Like for example, agovets they might run out of fertilizer for maybe four or five days, uh, and that happens on a regular basis. So, and because you're interested also in quality. 
So when farmers, they don't, they cannot buy it at the agrovet because it's just thrown out, they will go with the vendors at the market. So vendors are like a small stall, a, a person with a bar of fertilizer, and the way they were like handling the fertilizer, actually the bags of nitrogen were remaining open for very long hours. So it is expected that even if the, the quality, let's assume the quality of the fertilizer was high uh, at when it went out of the, of the factory, the way that these fertilizers are handling, uh, yeah, you're expecting that amount of nitrogen there, like they could be low, low very, very low. The other product that actually we had to, um, because we're working with soil acidity in Kenya, so, and we were trying farmers to adopt uh, agricultural lime, uh, we had to do all the distributions on a stock by Agrovet because it's a product that is not there. And the reason why the product is not there is not because it's expensive, actually it's because it's too cheap and the cost of transport is very high. Uh, but it could have like important implications in your nutrient balance because actually it helps your absorption of So, sorry, those two comments. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, and as you can all see, we have a few polls on our screen. Uh, we ask that you fill those out to help us uh, understand uh, how this webinar benefited you and help us a plan for future webinars. So thank you in advance for filling out our polls. We have about five minutes left for questions, so I'm hoping to squeeze a few more in. Uh, one question came in from uh, Timothy Russell, perhaps most uh, oriented towards hopes Hope's presentation. Uh, the soil testing kit looks interesting, but how close are we to having precision ag technology based perhaps on remote sensing for mapping soil fertility variation in Africa? And can high definition satellite technology be used to help? Yeah, I can say a little bit. Um, I think that's a fantastic question. That? Um, you know, the other thing that people have been talking about, uh, especially, so here at the University of Illinois, there's a number of folks in the crop sciences department that are trying to do um, remote sensing based measures of yield. And so they're kind of backing into these questions of soil quality um, because they're trying to think about you know, predicting yields, basically, right? And they're trying to do that for smallholder agriculture in you know, sub-Saharan Africa, which is a, it's a hard problem. So um, you know, they're thinking about that question. And one thing that they've gotten excited about um, and this could just be like a form of technological utopianism where it could have some real possibilities, I'm not really sure yet, but is using drones to gather data, you know, that would be a bit more, um, uh, have a finer geographic scale, I suppose, than sort of some of the broader um, satellite measures that you can currently get. And so you might end up filling in the sort of meso level that we're missing between the field level or the village level test and you know, in a satellite measure. So we, one thing that we're doing is we're actually taking our measures that we have at the field level and we're trying to see how they correspond to existing publicly available data that's based on um, uh, remote sensing data, right? And the correspondence is not great at this point. Um, and that's for a number of different reasons. And so I would say at this point, I think we would need some additional kinds of input to improve the um, precision of the, the sort of remotely based precision tools that are available, if that makes any sense. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that's going to improve. Yeah, this is uh, this is Michael Carter, and I <clears throat> just to chime in on that, we've just started working with a very high resolution imagery that we got from Planet Labs. So it's roughly, I think it's two meter by two meter resolution from their sort of fleet of little satellites. Uh, and, and it's definitely possible to pick up nutrient deficiencies in growing plants. We had not yet thought about, uh, uh, we, we had not yet thought about tracing that down to the underlying soil. I guess you probably could do that, especially in areas where management is not particularly interfering, at least in, in, in the short term. So we've been using it for yield prediction. Uh, but I think you could also more in the spirit of precision agriculture, you know, you can certainly pick up nutrient deficiencies 
Um, so that obviously would depend on the soil and then what management practices are being thing. But I like what you're suggesting, Hope, but you should look into this. It's Planet Labs did have an agreement with USAID, and they also have an academic wing, which they will make some of this, this two-meter by two-meter imagery available uh, for academic research uh, purposes, and they seem quite happy to be helpful when it comes to working on sub-Saharan Africa. Great. That's, that's really exciting. And uh, lastly, Michael, I know you wanted to quickly touch on, um, you know, uh, taking into account the fact that vouchers played a major role in take-up, or seem to. Is there a sense of whether this is due to liquidity constraints versus? I think that's a great question, and, and this I briefly mentioned this this project in Mozambique. And we had actually combined the uh, voucher intervention, which again was just a short-term thing, and someone from Miramar had chimed in about that being a good way to do it. That's how they're looking at it there, and I, I agree with that point. Uh, but we also matched it with a uh, with a savings, an improved uh, savings intervention, so people had better access to safe rates, uh, safe savings with positive rates of return. And we thought those two interventions would be complementary. And what we actually see is that farmers that got both the voucher coupon and the access to improved savings, actually, in after you know after the dust settled and they were you know working moving forward with what they had learned from the interventions, farmers that got both things actually saved a lot of money, uh, and farmers that only got the voucher interventions were investing more of their money in fertilizer, but were actually, as I mentioned before, they had a higher mean consumption, but not surprisingly they made their consumption more variable. And the farmers that were given a good savings tool, which is a way to self-insure yourself, invested some in fertilizer, but much more so in, in kind of self-insurance. So I think in the end, uh, I, what I take away from that, from that full range of that study is that in, in response to the question, I think it's exactly right. I think, I think vouchers are partly taking away some risk, at least temporarily, but if we really want people to sustain it, a lot of farmers are dealing with uh, with very large amounts of uninsured risk, and I guess to make my final comment, I sort of suggested at the beginning, you know, why this sort of African exceptionalism. These soil issues may be one. Another one may be the heavy dependence on rain-fed and highly variable uh, rain-fed agriculture and highly highly variable rain, and so maybe it's the combination of of these things which which perhaps explain the low uptake of some of these. Uh, these technologies, which at least in some places appear to be uh, profitable. Thank you, Michael. All right, I think we are out of time for our webinar today. We'd like to uh, end as close to on time as we can. But thank you so much to everyone who participated today. We really appreciated uh, the excellent questions, comments, and resources that you all shared in the chat box. We really appreciate that. Um, the Agrolinks webinars are really about the participants, uh, so thank you very much for joining us today. And of course, uh, thank you also to our excellent presenters from the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Assets and Market Access. We are really excited to be able to share uh, this, this new research on soils and soil variability, and we look forward to, uh, to much more from you all in the next couple of months. I'm interested to see everything that you share. And uh, also thank you very much to the uh, KDAD and AgriLinks teams who put on these webinars for us every month. So we hope to see all of you back for future AgriLinks webinars. Um, and I think that will complete our event for today. Uh, so thank you very much. We'll send out um, via email the recording and other resources from this event. So keep your eyes open.